My name's Kevin, I'm a, a senior uh, cloud security engineer at Netflix, and um, today I'm gonna talk to you about security groups. Uh, before we get started, who is familiar with and, and uses AWS in their day-to-day -day kind of uh, security methodology? Great. Of those people who uh, deal with security groups on a day-to-day -day basis, or who knows, knows what they are? Awesome. For those who don't, no worries, I'm gonna give you a bit of a primer. So what are security groups? Uh, essentially, security groups are just firewall rules by a different name. You can think of them in relatively the same context as you would any other firewall rule, restricting as access from uh, one application server to another on a networking level, right? So this provides us ingress and egress network filtering. It does this filtering by site arrange, by IP, by port, um, and it also has this idea of a group membership. So in your traditional firewall rule, these are standard kind of um, you know, rules that you may apply to an individual instance. You say this, uh, this IP, this static IP, or this range of IPs or, or network location can talk to, to me and have effective network communication. Security groups go one step further. And it's very important that we kind of talk about this because it's very unique to the way that AWS works and dynamic uh, kind of infrastructure works as a whole. So group membership in the context of security groups is essentially this idea that for any given instance, any given cluster, you can have anywhere between one to 1,000 to 100,000 of these servers. And managing access by an individual IP doesn't really make sense, nor does it make sense to manage them by even a range of IPs. Group membership, uh, or security groups as assigned to an individual instance, basically says that anyone within that role or within that group, that's that group associated with them, is allowed to talk to me. And in this way, it facilitates this kind of dynamic um, access to be allowed on a network level. Security groups are also account and region specific. So these rules are, are, have to be managed depending on your application uh, deployment uh, on, on many different accounts and many different uh, regions. So what are some limitations of, of security groups? So anyone familiar with AWS is that there's always a, always a limitation. So AWS does this to protect themselves. They do it to protect their customers. And they do it to give you um, basically boundaries and limitations such that you don't uh, end up affecting yourself long run. So for security groups, these are the default limitations for an AWS account if you went through and created it today. So you're limited to 500 groups, 50 rules, uh, and, and five groups per interface. And I, I wanna bring this up because it's important when we think about uh, some of the later concepts, we'll talk about it, but all of these limitations are uh, basically constraints to what we can do and how we manage our security uh, infrastructure and our, our security uh, deployment. So now you have a brief overview of, of what a security group is. It's a firewall rule, it's not very scary, just allowing very simple ingress and egress uh, network connectivity between two different uh, application servers or different instances. I wanna talk to you a little bit about the history of security groups and our experience with them. So back uh, when AWS was first deployed, uh, they had this idea of a, of a classic networking stack. And in classic, everything was very flat. So you can kind of think of classic as almost an internet, uh, uh, basically internet as itself, right? So every host was routable, every host was uh, generally available if it were uh, if it had connectivity um, in classic in classic networking for AWS, uh, security groups only controlled ingress access. They didn't control e egress access. Um, most access was allowed via this group membership mentality because you had lots of large uh, different server farms scaling up and scaling down. And this has since been deprecated. So if you spin up a new AWS account today, this is not the networking you are enabled. You may still have it if you're a legacy uh, account, but for all uh, intents and purposes, this has been deprecated by AWS, 
and they moved on to something called the VPC. So what is a VPC? So VPC would, is, is a networking kind of um, paradigm that you may be more familiar with if you're coming from a data center. Um, this was uh, basically a overlaid network on top of uh, EC2 Classic, and they improved a lot of different things uh, when they did this, right? So they went from this very flat networking architecture, openly routable to everything, um, and they went to a more uh, uh, conventional networking stack with dedicated subnets, routes, ACLs between those different uh, subnets, um, and just general in increase in network segmentation. Additionally, they also added egress filtering uh, to the, the ingress filtering, allowing you to, to specify both uh, inbound and outbound traffic to your individual instances. Uh, one of the most important things they added to uh, the VPC networking stack is the ability to essentially analyze your network flows between any given instance. In the EC2 Classic, we didn't have this ability. We were largely in the dark about uh, traffic going in and out of our particular instances. VPC introduced this feature called VPC full logs that it gives you NetFlow style um, ability to, to see the inbound and outbound uh, traffic flows for any given uh, uh, instance. So we were in that deprecated state for a long time. Um, and only just recently, probably about a year ago, did we undertake the migration to go from EC2 Classic to VPC. And as a cloud-first company that Netflix is, we had probably thousands of, of applications, um, hundreds of thousands of instances in this classic stack. And moving them to a new networking paradigm uh, was, was a big challenge for us. Uh, it took us a lot of time, took a lot of engineering effort to move into this new paradigm from things generally being accessible to having to worry about uh, subnets and IP space and, and routes. Um, and on the infrastructure level, what we really wanted to do was abstract this away as much as possible from the developers. So from their point of view, uh, they shouldn't really have to care this change is happening. They should be rightly focused on pushing new features and, and streaming awesome movies and TV shows. And during this process, uh, they, we made several different compromises. So before the compromises, we kind of uh, take a look at the constraints that we were facing, right? So EC2 Classic provided us no telemetry on which, um, which services we're talking to which. Um, internally, we're a microservices corp, uh, company, so we had lots and lots of different services, talking to lots and lots of other different services. This had grown organically. Um, the, de the dependency graph for those microservices was, um, was and still is very complex. Um, in addition to that, we, we had a compressed schedule. So AWS is, uh, was aggressively deprecating EC2 Classic and essentially um, gave us, uh, a, gave us a, not necessarily a deadline, but a lot of incentives to move off of EC2 Classic as, as quickly as we could. So some of the constraints, or some of the compromises that we made, um, essentially we needed a way to bridge the gap between this very flat networking stack and the, our new VPC uh, networking, networks. Um, this was provided via this idea of a, of a classic link, basically a, a private interface that spanned both the public EC2 classic uh, networking and our new internal uh, VPC address space. Um, and essentially what we did was we made those instances generally available to our VPC. Now, um, this was particularly tough from a security span st standpoint. Um, anytime we talk about security, we talk about least privilege, we talk about only allowing access to things uh, that actually need access to. Unfortunately, due to the lack of insight in the complex dependency graph and all the other constraints I mentioned, it became very obvious that that least privilege was not going to work for this migration process. So we decided to make a compromise to allow this access more generally uh, during this migration period. 
We also made the um, compromise with engineering teams explicitly stating that new accounts, um, new AWS accounts, would have no implicit access to a given uh, uh, given services within, within those VPCs. Um, and that was the one kind of uh, security uh, trade-off we were able to make during this migration process. So I want to talk a little about, about the current state. Um, I think it's, I always put this up in all of my slides because I think it's important for what, uh, to how we think about our problems and how we think about our, how we solve them. Um, at Netflix, we, we give a lot of uh, freedom to developers, right? So they're, they're pushing code, they own the stack, they own all, all parts of, of their, their application. And uh, as a security team, we, we don't try to put in roadblocks or uh, sign-offs or kind of processes that would um, inhibit them from deploying new codes and deploying new code and, and pushing new features. And from a security infrastructure team, this means that a lot of the work we do is providing tooling infrastructure, and infrastructure around uh, what we call a kind of a paved path or the right way to do things. The idea there being that if you give someone the option of, of walking through the woods versus walking on the road, they're obviously going to hopefully choose walking on the road because it's much easier or much more uh, incentivized to kind of uh, go along with uh, what's provided for them. And uh, by doing that, we can instill and, and kind of bake in security best practices uh, for them as they you know, walk down this path. In addition to providing that path, um, providing the infrastructure, providing the tooling to, to make their lives easier from the onset, the other component of this kind of culture of freedom is to essentially uh, ensure that we are constantly vigilant about people making mistakes. So if you kind of uh, have the notion that uh, people are always going to make mistakes, it makes sense that we should be building tooling and infrastructure and uh, best practices to catch those as quickly as possible. Um, and that's largely how we kind of think about our solutions. So for, for us in the security space, um, we think about this, th those two things, the paved path and, and the, the best, um, and, and the safeguarding against mistakes. Uh, the first step to doing that is uh, this idea of security maturity. So within our infrastructure, within our application deployment process, we enforce these three security groups on every application. The first one is, is fairly straightforward. This is the allow access from uh, basically humans, right? So the idea here is that uh, your average developer doesn't care about this. They um, don't know what a VPN, what a NAT is, what a bastion is, right? So we take care of that for them. We manage that security group. By default, that access is um, generally limited. And we have additional controls around how humans interact with, with those services. So we manage that for them. And that's on all of our different uh, applications. Uh, the second one here is, is similar, right? So think about infrastructure. Uh, generally, application developers just expect infrastructure to be there. So you think about uh, metrics, health checks, et cetera. Again, all that access is taken care of by us as a centralized team and uh, basically abstracts that away from the developers having to care about that. So our deployment process uh, ensures that those two groups are always placed um, so that developers don't really have to think about um, those two pieces of access to their application. And the third is essentially this idea that um, if we believe that application developers know best, they also know best about what applications need or which services need to talk to their service. Um, and this third group is their application specific group. So this is unique to their particular application and is controlled by the application owner. It is ultimately up to them uh, who can talk to them. And so they are allowed to modify this as they see fit. Um, this gives them the flexibility that um, and, and basically the locality that we can assume that that specific group is controlling access to all of their different, uh, to all the services that need to talk to them. And with these three things in mind, we can kind of start to make some assumptions about our environment where we wouldn't be able to necessarily do before. 
this kind of methodology also extends to technology specific groups. So you think about uh, all the different AWS technologies that exist, ELB, RDS, they all have different port requirements, they all have different um, perhaps access level requirements. And so we extend this, this kind of naming methodology to those technologies as well, uh, and enforcing basically that it, the central A's managed ones have e technology specific rules, or specific technology specific groups, as well as an application owner if they need access, or if they have an ELB, if they have an RDS, are again controlling access on applica application specific basis uh, for those technologies. Um, in addition to that, we like to manage a lot of our stuff um, as code. So what that means is that it's fairly transparent for adding new things. Um, we can basically have PRs into uh, new rules. We can see who added which rule into our kind of managed uh, security uh, state. And we can also enforce it. So we can basically say is, is the is the infrastructure as we say it is, right? So we can periodically check uh, what the current rules are for any given security group and then put them back if, if something's drifted. This again goes along with this, this idea of like safeguard. Essentially, we'll let you modify rules more generally, but there are gonna be certain situations where we say that is really not how it should be and we're gonna go ahead and, and put, place that back. Um, in addition to this, uh, we have many different accounts. We have over 100 different AWS accounts in, in at least three or four different regions um, in all those accounts. And uh, managing it as a template saves us a lot of work when it comes to you know, pushing out and making sure that uh, these security groups are the same account across accounts, regions, um, et cetera. So, now that you have kind of a, a good background into um, how security groups are managed at Netflix and how uh, we got to where we are today, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, an application called Grouper. And essentially what Grouper is is that we got ourselves into a, a pretty bad state, right, with this migration. Um, we are generally allowing access from a vast swaths of our infrastructure and we needed a way to uh, tighten that down to uh, obtain this, this idea of least privilege again. So Grouper essentially helps us do that by taking um, data about our environment, so metadata about um, what clusters are uh, actively launched, right, and which security groups are associated with them. Once it has this kind of cluster information about uh, the application itself and the security groups associated with it, basically the rules that it's allowing. It takes a look at the network flows for that particular application. Combining those two gives us uh, basically recommendations around uh, what should and should not be allowed. Um, here, the, one of the first steps we do is we, we target the, the ASG cluster, we grab the development uh, unit, so this would be like the ASG, the application name, any of these, the security groups associated with it. And we query an application called Dredge. Dredge is a metadata collection system. Uh, essentially, it, manage, it collects the VPC full logs and ties the metadata from AWS to those full logs. So if you've ever taken a look, full log or NetFlow is simply, uh, you know, I said TCP, the bytes kind of sent, uh, the source and desk, right? From a security perspective, that's not super useful. It's not even super useful from um, the perspective that these applications are changing all the time. An IP in uh, AWS can move from one host to the other dynamically. Uh, essentially, what Dredge does is to take and process that data in real time to determine who has that IP at any given time, and then allows us to make correct recommendations uh, regarding that, those different traffic flows. So here we talk a little bit about making the ideal reality. And essentially what we do is within Grouper itself, we take those observed flows, we take um, w this list of applications that are talking to each other, in inbound and outbound. We say what is the ideal uh, security state of that, right? 
So if you see an application that, um, based on its observed flows, is only receiving data or is only receiving network communication on port 80 from um, you know, a set of, of, of three or four clusters. But the security group rule, or so the security group rule for that particular cluster should only allow that port from those specific clusters. But, um, and, and then essentially we take that ideal state and compare it against reality, right? So um, from, uh, it, from our perspective, that, that becomes a recommendation. Essentially we say that if a rule um, is too permissive, that means it has more ports or more access than it needs to and it should be tightened down. Um, if it's extraneous, right, so if it's not being used at all, that rule should be removed outright. Um, and if it's, um, and it should, it should essentially allow you to create the best possible group that you, you can. Um, taking into account stuff like cross-region communication, the duplication of rules across events. So if a rule is in a managed rule, um, then we, we don't take it, take it to in, in consideration. It's a duplicate rule that's not necessarily needed anymore. And then we take these recommendations and we service them to application owner. So we don't make any uh, purposeful judgments. It's, it's largely about uh, creating insight to application owners. So allowing them to understand um, what uh, applications are, are talking to them and which applications are, are they, they are talking to and allowing them to make appropriate decisions on those recommendations, right? So, um, and, and, and this is presented to them essentially as a health metric. So we have, application owners have this ability to see the health of their application. It includes things like um, jars that are deprecated that they need to upgrade, um, things that are they're failing, so met, health checks that are, are failing and, and stale configurations. This is surfaced, this data, this, this configuration recommendation is surfaced alongside that so that they can see from high level what they can do to improve the overall health of their, their system um, relatively easily. And once they decide to uh, take action, they are able to do that um, as part of this kind of health uh, metric. So why do we do this? Well, we were in a state that uh, was highly permissive. We needed a way to clamp down on this. We needed a way to do that without breaking existing applications. So you think about a lot of these things, uh, very complex dependency graphs. Um, we wanted to make sure that developers could roll this out as they saw fit, as they were continually improving their application and empowering them to do that. Um, it also provides us with this ability to basically clean up a lot of cruft. So if, if you've ever tried to manage screw groups uh, on a one-off basis, essentially what happens a lot is a developer will keep adding rules until things work. And they don't actually understand why things work, but it works now so they're not going to touch it again. Um, this leads to a lot of very overly permissive rules. A lot, it leads to a lot of unused rules that you know, may have not worked for one reason or the other. Um, and it, it leads to a lot of these th different things that Grouper basically provides us the ability to clean up uh, using this recommendation system. Um, and again, it's very important to provide this backstop, this, this kind of check to help developers out um, when they have poorly thought out rules or rules that don't really make sense for their given application. So what are some challenges? So, uh, I talked, I mentioned briefly earlier that AWS has these idea of limits, right? So one of our big challenges to restricting access to be um, least privileged as possible for security groups and security rules is this r limit of 50 different rules. So this limitation is very important to us essentially because you cannot get, you can only get so specific. So take a, this example here. This 50 rules applies to both ingress and egress rules. If you have, say, 50 services that need to talk to you, you want to be as specific as possible, you can, you can have more than that, right? So this limitation becomes very um, difficult for us to manage and is a large reason why we are still not able to get as specific as we want today. Um, 
we're currently working with uh, AWS on trying to help and fix some of those flexibility issues, but it's still a very big challenge for Grouper to deal with today. Um, and essentially what it is, is it allows us to be best effort and to take this limit into consideration when we make our, our um, recommendations. Uh, another big challenge for us is essentially this idea that if you're using network flows to derive um, rules, what happens if those, those network data is very infrequent? What happens when that network data um, you know, hasn't been exercised in a very long time? So our ideal case here is that um, new applications know which services they need. Right? So they can properly ingress uh, the applications that, that need to talk to them. Um, and, and there's no problem there. The, the recommendations will line up cleanly with what the developer has added. And, and that looks great. Uh, problematic case is essentially where applications don't know which services need to talk to them. But uh, basically, they can have some downtime. They can have the ability to see what the errors are by looking at reject, rejected network requests. And we can go ahead and appropriately add those and create recommendations saying you need to add this, this service to your application. Um, and that's not so bad. It may, may break some applications for a little bit of time. The catastrophic case I, I mentioned here is kind of what keeps me up at night. Uh, essentially, this is the idea that new applications don't know which services they need uh, access to and have very infrequent runtime dependencies. So the most common scenario that this kind of happens was would be think, things like maybe you have a job that runs on a cron that's once a quarter. Uh, maybe you have a, a cache that is always getting hit. And only when a cache misses do you fall back to a secondary service that may never happen or may happen very, very frequently. Um, and so those two kind of cases, uh, we don't have a good solution for. It's, it's mostly around um, ensuring that we look uh, over a long enough period, if possible, of network information um, to determine what the, the long running dependencies may be. And um, it is currently something we're thinking very deeply about and trying to figure out if things like stack analysis can help, if, if there's some other methodology that um, perhaps could surface these runtime dependencies um, before they actually get triggered. So the future state of, of Grouper is evolving. Um, some of the things we'd like to uh, look into and would like to explore would be this idea of canary uh, screw changes. So if you've never heard of a canary before, it's essentially this idea of sending a little bit of traffic to a new configuration or a new uh, piece of code and seeing what happens, right? So if you send a, a percentage, a low percentage, maybe 1% of the traffic for any given service, uh, you want to see if, if something's failure. And we really want to try to extend this methodology to configuration changes, like configuration changes like security groups, um, so that we don't break all the services um, unnecessarily. We'd also like to be able to roll back changes automatically. So in the event that uh, a rule change was made that was, that was problematic as detected by um, a, a drop in requests, a drop in successful requests, uh, the ability to automatically take that back and reverse it um, would be really, really cool. And then the last thing we kind of want to think about is this idea of um, IP management. So today, in security groups, you kind of manage um, IPs as a very um, very spread out, a very disparate kind of system. Essentially, this, this string is, is spread out through all these security groups, and it's not a first-class citizen. Um, we struggle with managing these kind of rules uh, because they can change, and we don't have a good way of basically managing them centrally for all of our security groups across all of our different accounts, and that's something we really want to kind of explore. Um, I want to call out a couple things that uh, I've seen around. Demeter is, is a very interesting um, project out of uh, Coinbase that uh, manages your security groups for you. Um, so in essentially that idea of, um, that templating idea of having your template that's described to many different accounts and regions, Demeter will help you do that. And I also want to 
call out uh, another open source uh, Netflix project we have called RepoKid. Essentially, this idea of having or, or uh, taking um, actually access requirements and deriving uh, configurations off of them is what RepoKid does for IAM. So for AWS IAM, if you're not familiar, there's, there's different permissions uh, out to AWS's services. And what RepoKid does is to look to see which services you're actually using and then deriving a IAM policy based off of that so that you have the least uh, n possible number of services that you actually need. I want to throw up some, a couple other links. Uh, check out our, our tech blog. Um, we have lots of cool open source. Uh, obviously, if you'd like to come out to California and hang out with us, that'd be awesome, too. And um, that's really all I had for you guys.